Life is all about relationships. Lovers, family, body, or money. How satisfied you are can be completely explained by how you relate to things around you. This is Sophie Jaffe, and together with my husband, Dr. D. Jaffe, we are here to explore and teach you how to maximize your relationships and achieve a happier life. Let's get ignited. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the Ignited Relationships Podcast. I'm Adi Jaffe. And I'm Sophie Jaffe. And today, we're bringing you one of our biggest episodes ever. This is the most listened to episode that we've ever created and one that really signifies a lot of what Ignited is about. It, this is it. This is our story. This is the DNI's skeletons, our deepest secrets, our all of it. This is the story. This is the one where we share everything. And you're going to get the original recording from almost three years ago. Almost three years ago. And, you know, we had a vulnerability hangover for days after sharing this story. Um, it's a lot. So make sure that you are prepared. Yeah, and a lot of you might have heard this before, but um, A, we want to take out really the meat of it and kind of solidify that and, and show you that by itself. But also, look, with the ver- divorce rates going up around quarantine and the insanity of relationships during this time period, we really are so grateful for what this podcast has meant. And you guys have written us so much specifically about this episode. There are new developments and insights that we're going to talk about a little bit on the front end, but then we're going to keep a lot of those till after the episode so you can kind of get a refresher and tell you what have we learned and maybe even more importantly, what have you told us you want to know more about the story and we're going to go deeply into that. So many of you have shared this episode with your loved ones, with your partner. This is the episode that I refer right away when someone DMs me and they found one of my articles in a magazine on women's health, on the many articles that I've written. They say, I'm devastated. I feel lost. Where do I even begin? And I send them this episode. Yeah. And, you know, if you have struggled with cheating or have been cheated on, uh, if you are stuck in relationships and you're not really sure why they're not working out the way you want to, what we talk about here is not just how we got to those places where I cheated on Sophie, Sophie later cheated on me and, and how we came out of it, but noticing our patterns, the triggers, the, the trauma that came out of it. How do we heal from it? The wisdom and the growth that we got from that and having these experiences. And just remembering that our partners mirror to us what it is that we need to look at partners bring stuff up. You're in an intimate space. They mirror your shadows, your traumas, the darkness, and the murky places that you haven't attended to. Yeah. And it's so easy always to kind of, when something goes wrong, blame your partner for what went wrong. But what you're going to see in the story, what we learn and a lot in the insights that we share later is unfortunately, that probably means that the patterns you're repeating will be repeated. And so, you know, we really really want you to kind of sit down, take a little space for yourself and listen to the story as it unfolded for us. And as we told it again, almost three years ago, and then stay tuned at the end, because we're going to come back with the lessons and some of the specific answers to questions you've been asking us over the last three years about this story and how it may apply to your life. A quick recap of what you missed in the very first part that we're not including Our first meeting, falling in love, we tell this on other episodes as well, and we'll put this in the show notes, but we fell in love. I was just turned 20, Adi was almost 30, and we were in very different spaces in our life. We met at UCLA, we fell in love, it was fast, and we will recap this at the end of the the episode as well. Um, But we broke up after Adi cheated on me while we were still in school. Um, We broke up for about a year. I did some traveling and we found each other again. My best friend from childhood passed away suddenly and Adi was there for me and Adi's dad had cancer and I was there for him in different moments. And those are the things that brought us back together, including Adi doing a lot of work, which we'll talk about more in the episode. Yeah, absolutely. A very fast um, sinking together at the beginning of our relationship. And then within a year, this kind of falling apart and then What we talk about here is really the rebuilding after us getting back together, which is where a lot of couples find themselves. So we really hope you find this useful. And also, I hope that you hear and listen to this episode with a different lens. Listen to it from a bird's eye view and really look at 
it from a place of it's not about the sex. It's not about the cheating. What are the deeper underlying issues? And that's what we'll recap at the end of the episode as well. What were those shadows and those traumas and those things that we really were aching to connect on, but we didn't have the tools? Absolutely. So check out the episode. We will see you on the other side with lessons and answers to your questions. So yeah, so then we quickly actually got engaged like a year after that. Like within a year of Heather dying, we got yeah. engaged um, because my grandmother was dying. Mm. And I really wanted her to know that that was happening. I knew she wouldn't make it to the wedding, but I wanted her to feel... Yeah, I think we announced it at her yeah. hospice exactly center. Yeah, her yeah. little home. So... Yeah, I mean, we moved quickly. We were still deeply damaged. I was really scared. But like I knew, based on the fact that we had, that I tried to get you back and that we got back together after Thailand. I mean, I remember I picked up my dad and my mom. They were visiting. We went on a trip to Palm Springs, if you remember. Yeah. And we talked then, which was probably nine months before I actually proposed. But the only reason I, we were getting back together is because I thought we were going to get married. Sure. Like, yeah, no, th at that point, we were like we're doing this, we're in this. And we were fully committed to that idea. Which is important because yeah. I'm saying like, it wasn't as if it haphazardly happened. It was like... With the intention. There was definitely an intention behind it. Of a real commitment. Yeah. 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 yeah that I think that's a big thing is that we aligned at different points in our relationship in asking each other and ourselves, do we want this for the long haul though? Yeah. Are we committed to each other no matter what? And we were still having a lot of issues. Like yeah. we would fight on a regular basis. I remember we would go on these jogs and we would separate. So now we're we're engaged mm -hmm. and we were kind of still fighting and all this stuff. Yeah. And then on the way to, so you were converting. Again, I- I was converting to Judaism. These stories, like as, as I'm thinking of the stories, I'm, the, the word asshole just comes up in my head repeatedly. Um, you were converting to Judaism. For you. For me. Mm -hmm. Because I'm Jewish and you're not, mm -hmm. or you were not. And on the way to one of these conversion classes, on what must have been a Sunday, mm -hmm. you take my phone, you start looking through it, and you see texts that I was sending to an ex sex partner, somebody that you knew that I'd hooked up with before, years before us, uh, and you found texts. Yeah. Um, what was that face for? Because it wasn't years before, it was just when we were broken up. That last time too. Oh, right, right. yeah. You did, continuously we, went back to her. So she's not someone from years ago. Yeah, yeah. we hooked up once while we were broken up. But yes, I, I definitely had sex with her during that time. So you we, were you were inappropriately texting her. Yep. On one of the day before we went for a run and then we separated and went separate ways. And a D in a point of lowness emotionally reached out to this woman to get a hit and get a fix of yep. feeling high from attention. Yeah. So you found that text. And then I remember like we're outside of the thing before class starts and we're just like losing our shit because yeah. it was a really low point. And, and something clicked in me at that point. I go, oh shit, wait, I recognize this. I recognize saying to myself that I want something and being unable to get it. And that's when the addiction piece kind of first came in. And when people talk about this, like, is it really sex addiction? Is it not? Look, we're going to talk about this a lot over our podcast in general, this concept of addiction. What I know is I've recognized this pattern of doing actions that go against my best interest when I know I want something and yet I'm sabotaging it. And that's what I recognize. And I said, you know what? I, I understand what this is now. I'm going to go try to find a little totally. bit of help around it. And, and this is applicable to anything. Like if you notice... I think that's the point of like, am I an addict? Is there something wrong here? If you take away the word addict, is there something a little wrong and off about this? Like with me with food, for sure, it was like, okay, I feel out of control right now yeah. and I am self-sabotaging. And instead of going out with my friends right now, I'm at home eating ice cream because I have now kind of, I'm now out of control that's not what I want. I don't want to be home eating ice cream, like with my head in the freezer. Right. I want to be out with my friends being a normal human. But, and that was kind of like my own understanding as well. And I think you actually said this about an addict. Like, how do you know if it's a problem to someone? Someone was like, well, how do I know if my drinking problem is actually a problem? And you were like, well, is it affecting the people in your life negatively? Yeah, is it affecting is it your affecting interaction with other you? people, your responsibilities? Yeah, your responsibilities. Are you showing up late to work? Are you calling into work? Are you 
So you can apply this to any type of addiction from sex to porn, to gambling, to shopping, to technology, to alcohol, to drugs. So just to expand on that. Yeah, yeah. no, absolutely. So I recognized it at the time. The only thing I knew to find that I could access in the moment was um, essentially 12 step based kind of meetings for this sort of thing. Right. You said I've, I've been here before. Just like you can go to AA, you can also go to sex addict meetings and I'm going to do that. I'm going to find something. Yeah. He was, he was essentially on his knees and he was like, I'm going to go, I'm fucked up. And clearly this is a similar behavior to the drug addiction, but now it's being manifested in this other way through girls and lies. And I didn't understand it to be perfectly honest. I had no idea. Right. But whatever you said, it made sense and I believed it. And that was my piece of why, like the why of why I understood and believed it is that a D had been through this before he had walked this path before and it tr- made me feel like I could trust him because he did. I, he's that same person that I sat in the courtroom with. He's the same person that I met at UCLA during his graduate program, getting straight A's, you know, doing really well, doing his best, showing up, calling his dad every day, calling his mom every day. Like he's the same person that was standing before me on his knees, fucking up, texting inappropriately with women. It's the same person. So I was like, okay, if he can do that, he can also probably get through this. And if he can't, we'll find out real quickly. Yeah. And don't, don't I wish that that's as bad as it got, but I started going to meetings. I started talking to people there. I started kind of going pretty regularly, like at least a few times a week, if not every day of the week for a while. But it was very much your thing. I was disconnected. I was like, oh, you've got a problem. You go fucking fix it. You go see your doctor. You know, like it was very disconnected from me. I had no... I had no idea what was going on and I had no... We're still going to a couple's therapist. We're We're still still doing all that stuff. We're still seeing a couple's therapist, but it was much more... It was disconnected from this whole thing. Sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Um, I go to the meetings. I'm in the meetings. I'm finishing up a PhD. We now get married. Um, I'm At some point in the middle of all this, I'm already seeing like a, a a real like sex addiction kind of therapist. I think I think this is actually, it's funny because our timeline gets messed up right yeah. around this point all the yeah, time. Yeah, it's confusing. But, but the point we is... We get married. We get married and even on our wedding night, we didn't have sex. Yeah. We were sober. So just like an alcoholic has to go have sobriety for a while. I mean, how and our intimacy was messed. Our up. intimacy needed a recalibration for sure. So his therapist said, you know, you need to go 30 days without masturbating, without sex, without any, any sort of touching in a sexual way. Yeah. So this is where kind of my timeline gets messed up. And one of these days we're going to have to go back and look at it because there's another gauntlet that drops and, I think we should tell this because it, to me, in my head at least, it has to do with all the non sex. This is when all, I was three months pregnant with Kai. Although Kai, yeah, you're already so pregnant. I know when that was. Okay. It was uh, f- right after Val. We went to Ojai for Valentine's Day and I was pregnant. We had Luca recently, our dog, and we went to Ojai for a weekend. We had a really beautiful weekend and a picnic. And I remember I was just had a little tiny bump from Kai. I was 12 weeks mm. pregnant and we went to our first sonogram. And the next day, so the next day I'm at UCLA, I'm doing my PhD work. I'm like I'm doing my rat work. Yeah. You you're at UCLA. I'm babysitting in Santa Monica. The baby goes to sleep and I'm just up. And I had this suspicion. I had this intuitive feeling that I don't led, think I've ever heard this part of the story. So. Yeah. I let, it just led me down a rabbit hole and I, I don't even know what came over me, but there was something, something. And those of you that have ever been through cheating or found something that you wish you didn't find. Um, it just led me to this thing. How did you find the email? I have no idea. Okay. I have no idea. And okay. I mean, it, for hours I was down a rabbit hole and one thing mm. led to another. I found a, a fake email address that a D had set up under a completely different name and an Ashley Madison account. So this was in case you haven't heard of Ashley Madison, cause I definitely did not. Um, it's an online kind of website before there were apps. <laughs> it's an online website for men who are supposedly married and 
in order to cheat. So you could then go meet up with women. You could email with them. You could have online sex with them. You could exchange pictures, videos, letters, anything you want, but you pay for it as a service. So he actually signed up for this before we were married and lied and said that we were married, which was even more annoying Mm. and (laughs) even more like, what the fuck? So maybe that's why I have a hard time with the timeline because I actually signed up for it before. Yeah. So, so from my standpoint, I get this call. I'm in the I'm in the lab, the like basement. dissecting, he's in, dissecting the ba- rats. he's in the basement of UCLA for his dissertation, dissecting rats. And I see your call repeatedly, yeah. which you never do, and that's how I know it's an emergency. And I walk out, and I'm holding the phone, and you say, "I found the email," and that's the only line that I remember from that entire conversation. And like my throat is in my stomach, my heart is like. You were caught. In my legs. You were fucking caught. It was hard to breathe. Yeah. I just, I was gone. And beyond caught, it's like you were fully seen. Like yeah. If you take away the negative connotation, like you were fully seen, which must have felt like later really freeing, but in the moment like shit, because it was like these it was dark. Like, yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's good to say fully seen. I felt the same way that you would feel if you kind of like, you think you're sleeping and you open your eyes and you're actually butt naked in the middle of the mall. Yeah. Like that was the feeling I had. Yeah. Like compl- so much shame. I couldn't I couldn't breathe, like I couldn't swallow. I was just gone. And I remember that. I mean, I'll never forget that moment for as long as I live. It's now been 9 years mm-hmm. or something. More than that, yeah. Um and I'll never I mean, it'll, it'll never leave me the the sense. It's like a it's like being shot or something. I don't know, yeah. like something like the equivalent of that PTSD after that moment. And I don't mean to, that's, I'm not talking about it. Like, um, like it was my trauma. It was your traumatic moment, but yeah, I got fully, fully naked in front of you, which were the only person that was really, really close to or cared yeah. what, what they would think of me in that moment. And I knew that it was up. Like I had no idea what was coming on the tail end of this. Yeah. But I knew it wasn't good. Yeah, and we came home. We came to our apartment. We were married. I was pregnant. I looked up abortions. I was. I took my wedding ring off. I threw it at you. I was pretty much done. I was like, I can't believe we're back in this place. You've been going to these meetings. What a bunch of shit. Yeah, this is like a year into that. Yeah, like this is a year into that. This is now several years after the first cheating. Like what, how, I couldn't. My reality just completely flashed before my eyes and nothing like up was not down. Dark was not dark. Dark was not light. Like every single thing was flipped. Like the same level of confusion you're having right now. Yeah. (laughs) Trying to explain it. But, but like dark wasn't dark anymore and light wasn't light. Everything was just confusion and I didn't trust anything. Yeah. And in the spirit of what everybody else told you, by the way, cheater always cheats like, it, it was right there. Yeah. Like I was proving that right. I cheated and you took me back and then I was texting people and you took me back and then you found out I was having like, and just so we're clear, like essentially having like online sex chat and, and exchanging pictures with women online. Yeah. He didn't actually meet up with anyone. He was too chicken shit, but they, I went through every single letter, every mm. single email, every single exchange, this secret Fuck. identity that he that must have sucked. I'm it sorry. Sucked. It sucked. Every single like letter he exchanged with these women and like they were pretty intimate letters and he went online and had like video like I would be in the shower for like 10 minutes and he would get online and video chat with someone. Yeah. Like what the fuck? Yeah. yeah. Like how, how, how it's insane. And like that, that layer and that level of betrayal of like, again, I'm just going to take a shower and my husband is in the other room inappropriately connecting with another woman and that is horrifying that is just it's like it just made me feel like the shittiest shit on the ground yeah so this is where the why i'm always confused with the timeline the way i remember it is this one actually did that outpatient thing in a in a local center here and we spent whatever money we had on getting the help that we could because it was like it was that or we're done yeah and, I, that, and that was the thing that he's like, so he basically, again, was down on his knees. This time he's crying and he's like, this is it. There is nothing else. You now know everything. And 
apparently this sort of online stuff he had been doing since he, since he was a drug addict. So like I overlooked because I wasn't looking for it, but like I overlooked coming into his graduate housing several years before that. And there were, I like, remember IMs? <laughs> yeah, this was like, uh, like MSN messenger. messenger or whatever. Yep. And he would have like sideways smiley faces up on the screen, but I wasn't nosy and I didn't, I trusted you. So I didn't go there. I just kind of like took it at face value. He's a friendly guy. Like, great. Yeah. And it was a part of my life. I mean, since like the MySpace and before that days. It pro- I mean, sure. it makes sense. Like it may, I've never went down that path online, but it makes sense that once you can be online hidden behind a computer screen that you can find porn and then instead of porn, like, why not connect with other women who are like horny and blah, blah, blah. Oh, and now I can pay for this. And now it's a service. I mean, it makes sense that this other dimension would contain that just like in the real world, there's prostitutes and there's, you know, all right. these different things. So, but it was definitely like porn, a way to escape. Yeah. To kind of, well, or the way I talk Feel about good. it with clients now is like, be certain that I'm going to get what I want without Working. really putting in the work that you have to put in a normal relationship. So yeah. whenever I would need something, even in our relationship, I would go to that to exactly. get it, which means I wasn't even showing up and present to our relationship because exactly. I, I didn't need it. Which anymore. was just perpetuating our problem of intimacy because totally. you were getting it from somewhere else. So then this issue that I felt was my fault and my fault alone because I had been in an abusive relationship then was accentuated because you were getting it yeah. somewhere else. Yeah, yeah. So, so now, now that's where we're at. So now we're several months pregnant. Adi is in rehab. It's an outpatient program here in LA. You want to tell them the name? Should we? I mean, it was called the Center for Healthy Sex. Yeah, Center for Healthy Sex. We kind of worked out. We, there was a couple that do this like intensive week to two weeks of thing, but yeah. um, we did whatever we could afford. We couldn't I even afford the real program. I think it's good to share resources for things. Sure. Yeah, so there's 12-step meetings. We went found a really great therapist. We, I saw someone individually, you saw someone individually, and we saw someone together. And then he was doing this outpatient, really intensive rehab, um, specifically for sex addiction. Yeah. 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 Um, the reason I'm, I'm always weary is we've moved actually far past the sort of stuff that, that these places do, but it's really good for crises. Oh, well, yeah. Um, so we go, we have couples work now, we have this, there's like a support group for women that you hated more than life itself. Oh. I mean, what I have to say to anyone that's going through this is you have to find someone that's a good fit for you. So if your therapist makes you feel nauseous when you leave, you got to find a new therapist. If you go to a support group and you cry every time you leave, find a new support group. And I kept trying to like muscle through it. I'm like seven months pregnant, huge, uncomfortable with my first baby. And I would go to these support groups and it was just not a good fit for me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I you think hated just, it. I hated it, but I was like, oh, I need to get, I need to get us better. Um, and we joined a couples group yeah. that we still go to to this day. Yeah. Every so Sunday. shortly after that group, when I was miserable and I spoke out to a D and said, look, this group doesn't work for me. I really feel uncomfortable. I cry every time I leave. They're just not my people. I need something that feels good to me and feels like my people. So then he reached out to someone that he had connected with now is a really good friend, but someone he had connected with at the meetings and he and his wife had a couples meeting every Sunday night Yep. that was kind of like loosely based on 12 step, but it wasn't about that. It was about getting together with other couples who were committed to each other and sharing. So everyone in these groups actually was married and still is. And we still nine years later go to these meetings. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Every Sunday we break bread together. And again, that's part of the reason why we want to talk is, a lot of other couples don't have examples of people who went through this and made it. And that's what's so nice about that group is there are the exactly. couples who made it. Exactly. It wasn't just a bunch of people sitting around complaining about their husbands like the group I was in. It was the husband and the wife. Again, we still go to these meetings as, as often as we can. We have dinner together as families. <laughs> and then we, you know, as couples and one big group. And then we sit and we have a meeting and we talk about for you know, several minutes each in our individual shares, what's going on with us in our coupleship and what's going on with us personally and hearing from other women in the group, other wives, and then hearing from the men in the group, the husbands who were the, you know, sex addicts 
or whatever it is that that's good that they're going through hearing from them really was healing for both of us i yeah. think hearing both sides of the of the partnership i think i want to go back real quick to that low point because we kind of all of a sudden it seems like everything is great um what was important to me in that low point was like you said that everything was out and that is a painful process to go through because whatever it is that you might be struggling with in your relationship if there are elements to yourself, parts of yourself, parts of your partner that are unseen because they're too much for you or too much for your partner and you don't feel like you can talk about them or you're so ashamed of this part of yourself, the way we've worked through it at least is figuring out how to let all that go. And again, I'm sorry to say I wasn't, I didn't man up and reveal it myself. You had to find it. Exactly. But in that revelation, in the emptying of my closet from skeletons was this new freedom. And by the way, this is the same thing that worked for me around my addiction was it was only when my parents and my friends and my sister knew that I was really a drug dealer and went to jail and all this stuff. When everything was out, the slate got cleaned up and now it felt painful to add stuff to it. Whereas before I was adding pain to pain and it didn't matter. Yeah. So I just want to kind of focus on that a little bit. Because a lot of people will tiptoe around the pain and they will try to, well, no, I don't want to deal with the other stuff because no. I don't want to hear about it. Yeah. The way we've worked through it, at least, and I'm not Sitting saying it's the a must for everybody, is you got to empty it out. Like, you got to find out everything there is. And we went deep. We, we had a few, a few disclosures. If you are in like that world of sex addicts, they, there's a, like a procedure of going through this. We didn't really do it right. No. We had a regular couples therapist. Well, we did it. I just didn't talk about everything. Well, no, and we didn't have a, a sex addict trained sex addict therapist. Like we, we saw just a regular therapist for a while who was our couples therapist. And she was like, look, this isn't really my, this isn't my specialty. I'm not certified in this, but if you want me to guide you through a disclosure, I will. So I remember you came in with your laptop and you had your list of women that you had been with. And this was, I requested everyone you had ever been with on any level from kissing on. And you did your best <laughs> yeah. to come up with that. But, you know, and I think it was actually from any sexual experience. So you started it when you were in early teen, masturbating and finding your dad's porn. And you went from there. And it was women you had kissed from your first girlfriend to X, Y, Z. And you went through every single person. You were like, this girl I met in Ohio. <laughs> that we like went to dinner and I kissed. And it was probably really good for you too and very cleansing to just go through everything and like, okay, here's the, here's the timeline. And my experiences and seeing how it builds and seeing where there's like a higher concentration and all of yeah, that. Yeah. I didn't, I honestly, at the time I didn't connect dots. It was just no. about, it was just about giving you what you needed. Yeah. And I needed that. So let's be clear about that. I needed to know everything. I was that way. You were that way. And that's what helped us heal. Yeah. Um, I think some people actually do claim that they don't want to know things about someone's past. Yeah, my only question is when you don't want to know about somebody's stuff, like the message that is being sent implicitly in my mind is I don't want to know all of you, Yeah. right? Because our experiences have shaped who we are to this point. And look, there's no doubt that there are things that are ridiculously shaming. Um, but my partner should be the person who knows me. Exactly. Uh, I, I completely agree. I completely in, agree. in our relationship. And right? I think just question that. Like if you both are the type of people that are like, oh, I don't want to know what he or she did before I met her that that's okay. As long as you really dig in and ask yourself hard questions. Why don't I want to know? What is it that I'm hiding from it? Am I feeling ashamed? Do I not want to feel jealousy? Do I not want to feel hurt? Like what is that underneath that? And I think yeah. that's the more important thing um, for us. Putting it all out there really made a difference. And so the first, so the first like, yeah. oh my God, kind of shock after obviously my fucking up was doing that disclosure and dealing with I mean, you wanted to know, but you didn't want to know, right? Like you wanted to know, but it caused pain. Of course. And so then the shockwaves of that, and it was weeks and weeks and weeks and months and months of pain that you now have all this information that you have to process. Yeah. Um, to be clear, like we couldn't watch TV at all. We couldn't go to the movies at all. Oh, because we couldn't go to a restaurant because you would look at a waiter and waitress and I would feel hurt or it would creep into my dream and then you cheated on me with the waitress from the restaurant the night before. It was, sure. it was beyond like we were unable to function in normal society and we had to go back to completely bare. 
Yeah. And we had set square one and we had set very strict rules. And again, I'm sorry about the timeline guys. I don't really remember if this was after the second thing or the third. I, the th- I, yeah. I keep mess- messing this part up, but like we put rules in place. So I was not allowed to communicate with women at all without Sophie being Yeah, there. he had to delete all the phone numbers that were women in his phone. We went through his phone in all his contacts together and deleted every single person. Every one of those women. Anyone. I don't think that, we deleted any not, women. We, would delete, we deleted anyone that I felt uncomfortable yeah, with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but even beyond that, I wasn't allowed to talk to other women, yeah. period. So wrote that off. Um, I wasn't allowed to go hang out with guys and like go drinking. Sure. I still hung out with guys, but I didn't. I wasn't allowed to like go out to the bar and hang out with guys and drink without you there. So we we really we tightened the screws big time. We started sharing location with each other right around that time. At the time, we put a screen like a mach- like one of those nanny things on my laptop. Yeah. So I couldn't log on. We found out a month and a half, two months into this whole thing that it was actually broken. And it wasn't working well, but that didn't for me. That wasn't an issue, and you kind of bought it for whatever reason but it was that that was never something i went back for like i don't know if i was just traumatized by the whole ashley madison thing or what that was but i didn't Me go log on to porn or any of that kind yeah. of stuff but we tightened the screws big time like masturbation was off my list like all these things that i wasn't allowed to do yeah you and weren't allowed to watch porn alone you weren't allowed to masturbate you weren't supposed to talk to women you weren't allowed to i mean anything you had to report everything yeah, so yeah. and this lasted a while. And P.S. guys, at this point, he is teaching at UCLA to 18-year-old women in the psych department, and that's his job, like five days a week at that point. Mm. And so that, I mean, for me, that was really painful to know that he's reporting to this job that he's standing in front in a power position to these little girls who are hormonal and horny and, you know, like I I know who I was at 18 and you don't really know who you are. You're figuring it out. And it made me feel uncomfortable. And at every time after class, we'd have a conversation and I'd be walking in the neighborhood with my dog or doing something. And I'd be like, okay, any cute girls? Did you feel anything? And we'd have to go through this thing. And it was so painful and so hurtful in the beginning. And you know, thank goodness you were honest and you showed up because at this point you had nothing left to yeah, hide. Yeah, like I was talking about it. Actually, it was hard to be honest. I like tried to protect you at the beginning and then realized that it's not helping. I would. So this is the process. I, we're this in this. Process. We're in this other place with it now, and it's so much easier to be honest. Um, like I, I say that now five percent of the stuff makes me ashamed when I have to share it with you, but back then it was ninety five percent of the stuff. Yeah. And I just had to kind of verbally throw up this stuff and just get it out there. Yeah. But. We talked about billboards, like my, my the American Apparel billboards that were across my office, and you pretty much kind of bitched me out and got mad at me for every one of these things. But whether you're a guy listening to this, or whether you're a woman listening to this, or whether you're the one who's perpetrating the issue and kind of like are the one that is in trouble, or the one who is um, is being kind of put upon, the pain is part of the process, unfortunately, Absolutely. because. Part of what ends up happening when you've been hiding parts of yourself for years or decades is you feel shame anytime an inkling of that part of you comes up. And here we're asking you to just go fully, you know, buck naked in front of your person and say, hey, this came up for me. This feeling came up where I thought about this other person. It's going to have to be a relearning of how to communicate in unlearning of how you used to do things and the way you used to show up to relationships and to your own vulnerability and to yourself and a relearning together with your partner in a new way. Yeah. And it's really hard and you do need a guide and you do need some, you need a support system and you need new friends that are probably going to speak to you in this way and be vulnerable and be honest and call you on your shit. And not everybody's supporting it. I mean, again, I totally get why people kind of just imagine I would fuck up forever. Right. Yeah. Like, I, it's not like I wasn't, I was giving people a lot of trust, um, in my, to my mind as it worked, the way I saw it in, in my head that didn't make it okay, but it, it moved from like physical cheating to virtual intrigue and like communication with somebody I actually had hooked up before. So there's a really intimate connection there to connecting with people I, I was never really going to talk to, never really going to see. So it was like at a distance. And what I was trying to do is at every step do less quote unquote cheating 
while still getting the hit that I needed. Exactly. But the realization was it's, all it's the, the same. trying to get that hit that is the problem, exactly. not the specific action. People and you're get still so getting f- high. You're and still th- getting high. So this is why thing. I have a problem with the if my partner ever did X, I would leave. You think that's a clear answer. Like if they ever cheated on me, well, what's cheating? Yeah. Like if they watch porn, is that cheating? If they watch a live video chat, is that cheating? Like, how do you, at what point is it cheating exactly. versus to say something else? If I recognize that my partner is not being truthfully intimate with me, then that's something we're going to have to work on or I'm gone. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, if my partner is not wor- willing to work on intimacy with me, then I'm gone. There's a totally different thing. Exactly. Um, so we worked a lot. Like, we were seeing our therapist two to three times a week for a while. We, we dove all in. And the good news for anybody listening right now and expecting there is no other big shoe to drop. I didn't screw up again uh, for the remainder of our relationship up until now, but the story is not really over. Um, we were doing well and working on a relationship and becoming stronger and stronger in a relationship. And we had, I felt safe. We had boundaries in place. We were in a pretty good place in our relationship. Pretty there was normal. A pla- like- yeah, there was a place every once in a while that like a slight deviation from the boundaries would happen but they were tiny and they get caught really really quick and our boundaries have three different levels so inner circle was like non-negotiables you may not do this or it's going to be a big trouble like we're going to have to go to three times a week for therapy and i might leave you and like the inner circle was big it was like cheating with someone outside of our marriage porn without me there like really specific things that were inner circle and those changed over time. Yeah. So now you can watch porn without me. I don't care. You don't do it. I don't, but but you could. Yeah. Because it's not that's not what it's about for me. I'm not worried about you going online and seeing a virtual like some person virtually for me now. Sure. Um and where we've come is pretty crazy and we'll get into that later episodes, but we are in a way more trusting and open place than we ever were even at the very beginning. So we definitely have gone through lots of different levels of this. and So safety was there. Safety was there with a D. I, at this time, was feeling very resentful because I, once again, back again to the intimacy stuff, I wasn't feeling intimacy with my partner. And to me, there, there wasn't like, oh, he must be getting it somewhere else. It was just this piece of resentment where I felt like, when is he ever going to connect with me? When is, when is this ever going to get past this broken record of me begging him to just be closer and give me more affection and all the things I felt I was needing and expressing and he refused to do. And at this time, he was working all the time. We lived an hour outside of the city, which I wanted for the kids and I needed to get out of the city for a little while. And he wasn't home very much and I had no intimacy with my partner. Um, I felt all these things. And then I met someone over the summer about three years ago. Um, and he was a director and I felt I'm, I'm, I act in commercials and I do print work. And I met this actor who my stepmom knew and he's just an incredible person and actor and made me laugh and understood me. And I kind of like had a crush on him and liked that he saw this side to me, this like, you know, this side of like potential and growth and, and acting and this side that you never really resonated with or connected with and kind of dismissed. You were like, I don't get it. I don't know why you do that stuff. And like very dismissive. You're very different now about it. But at that point you were kind of like, I don't even get why you do that. It's such a waste of your time. And it was something that really mattered to me and I felt dismissed. So I felt, I found this guy who was into it. He wasn't even that attractive, to be honest. It wasn't about that. I wasn't physically attractive, but he gave me that the, fill and that He gave attention. you that hit. That he gave I me that a hit, that hit and that attention and, and made me feel good. So then we went out to dinner one night and I told Adi that I was going out to dinner with him. And again, Adi and I were pretty disconnected at this time. But so we went out to dinner. It was a lot of flirtation, a lot of like, he was saying inappropriate things and I would say like, that's inappropriate, but it was still happening. And then we got, I got home and I went to tell Adi about it and you were just like, cool. Like he just, Adi didn't really seem to care. And again, just another level of like our lack of intimacy Mm. where it just was, I felt like, wow, he doesn't even fucking care. Well, that's funny. I don't remember that night the same way. I remember you 
telling me and actually kind of being a little. This that was the second time. Ah. Yeah. Okay. So I remember you telling me that you had met this director. There was nothing like. Oh yeah. Inappropriate about it. You just went out to dinner with a totally. director. Yeah. I was like, okay. So, and I might, I might not even be remembering this in the right order either. It doesn't really matter. But the point is that I was feeling neglected by you. Yeah. And then I got attention from someone else. We started texting. He'd call me in for commercials sometimes. Um, you know, it, like just that charge. Like there was this like physical charge and emotional charge when he was around and nothing ever happened with him physically, but I definitely felt excitement for another man. Right outside of our marriage. And then on New Year's, so that was over the summer that I met him. So like about six months of like going back and forth and inappropriate texting. And, um, he really wanted to be with me. And I was like, I don't think that's going to happen. And sometimes I would share with a D and sometimes I wouldn't cause he really didn't seem to care because we were so disconnected. And then over New Year's, we were partying with our friends and the kids were with a babysitter and we were staying at a hotel and we were highly intoxicated. I was very intoxicated. <laughs> and um, it was about three in the morning. We had just gotten back from the East Coast and like it was six o'clock in my body and I was just like, completely out of my mind. I was not in a good place with you, with a D, and I was not. Which I didn't really know, but that's my level of disconnection, but I didn't really know. Sure. So in my mind, I was resentful. I didn't even want to go to New Year's. I was annoyed with a D. I didn't want to spend time with him. I didn't want to pretend. I didn't want to even party because I was like, I'm not in a good place. I don't feel solid. Um, but we had plans with our friends and, you know, so we committed to this hotel room and we already paid for it and we already said we would. So we all go and put on a happy face and party. And then around two in the morning, a D went to sleep. Um, I wasn't done. I was like, I want to go hang out and have fun. So my girlfriend and I went up to the rooftop and we were in our bathing suits with bathrobes over and just went up to go swimming. And then the pool was really cold. So we ended up talking to these people, this guy that was with his dad, he was sober and, um, sober that night and sober in general. He was young. He was like mid twenties maybe. And we, we're kind of arguing the entire time. We were arguing about different th levels of addiction and he knew some of my friends and we just kind of got into it. And then I feel like I offended him. Actually, we go back to the room to go to sleep and I felt so guilty. And I told my girlfriend, like, I feel really bad. I need to go find him and apologize because I was just actually an asshole to him and kind of out of line. I need to apologize to him and his dad. And so I walked down the room and she's like, you're never going to find him. Like he left, he left where we were. Like, you're not going to find him. It's three in the morning. I walked down the hallway. And as soon as I walk out of our room, I hear his voice, his dad's voice. And I turn and there's his hotel room. And I put my ear up against the door and I hear his dad and him talking about this conversation and about me and about what just happened. And I knocked on the door. And at this point I had changed into pajamas and I was like, I'm so sorry. Like I was completely out of line and I, I'm just sorry. And they thanked me and they were like, his dad was like, it's water under the bridge, honey. And he had a Southern draw. And, and then I was like, okay, well, I'm going to go back to bed now. And I go to close the door and the guy follows me out and says, oh, I'm going to actually, I'll walk you to your room because I'm going to um, I'm going up to the roof to have another drink or something or whatever. Like he wasn't having a drink, obviously, but I'm going to go up to the rooftop. So I somehow I'm like still on substances at this point. So I like kind of follow him up the stairwell and we get up to the hallway and then we're standing out in front of the hallway and I don't remember exactly what he was saying, but just saying things. And he's like, come here, I want to show you something real quick. And he brings me into the bathroom, to the men's bathroom closes the door and locks it behind me and starts making out with me. And one thing led to another. We had sex. Even, you know, in that moment, I take full responsibility for all of it. And, you know, I said out loud to him, I'm married. This is not good. Like, I need to go get my husband. But it didn't matter. The point was that in my mind, I was like, Adi did this to me. And there was no time and space in that moment 
it was like tit for tat. I did this to me. Now it's my turn. And I let myself kind of like enjoy it and be in the moment. Although I knew it was wrong and I felt guilt and felt a little sick. I still was like, this is something I need to do right now. And I did. And it was like three minutes <laughs> at most. Mm -hmm. And then it ended. And uh, I ran back to the room and Adi was awake at that moment because our friend had woke, woke you up, I think. And so I walk in and I told you both what happened. And that was it. That was like our kind of next level of betrayal and lies and deceit and cheating. And this time it was my, my doing. I was the one that for the first time in my life cheated on my partner. Yeah. I, um, ma'am, just hearing that story right now, like <laughs> makes me shake a little bit. Same. Um, for sure. Like clammy hands shaking. I literally didn't think you were telling me the truth. Like no. I thought you were lying. Yeah. To my me. girlfriend, <laughs> we were sitting on the bathroom floor in the hotel room and I told them both and they both were like, they just didn't believe me. And I kept being like, no, it's true. And they're like, okay, so, and it I mean, took, it, was, a, it took a little while to like really get you. And then like when you realized it, then you were so fired up and then, <sighs> Oh, that amount of anger that came out of your body. I mean, a D is never like hit me or scared me or like even, even you saying the words that he never hit me sounds so bizarre well because i came from a relationship where like he just threw me around anytime he drank so it's yeah. like a d is just not a violent person and not an aggressive person but the amount of anger that was coming out of his body i didn't think he was gonna hurt me but he probably could have like killed this guy um you were really angry and so he went on a hunt for him he stayed up the rest of the night looking for him, sending me pictures. Is this him? Is this him? Is this him? It was crazy. It was crazy. And in that moment, cracked out, <laughs> like hadn't slept all night. I remember thinking, this is going to be the best thing for us if we get through it, <laughs> if he stays with me. Because <laughs> to me, I was like, this was so out of character for me and something that I had never, ever, ever, I'd never had a one night stand in my life. I had been with three men at this point. I mean, still I've, I've been with three men in my life and well, four, four counting him four. <laughs> but been with four men, two serious committed relationships. Another one I was dating. I had never had a one night stand. I had never slept with someone that I didn't really care what, about or love. And all of a sudden I'm on the other side and it was crazy. It was gnarly for several weeks. It was crazy. My friend stopped talking to me for several weeks, several months. Um, she was in such a place of judgment and just like told me I better go get tested and what kind of mother are you? And just so much hate and fear. And, you know, part of me felt like I deserved it. The other part was like, how could you do this to me when I need a friend, I need my best friend. And she had told me several times about her cheating on, on relationships and I held space for her. And, you know, same with you and I, like I, I there was part of me that was like, really, where's my tribe? But then another part of me that was like, I deserve all of this. And it was scary and awful. And I, I honestly questioned if I didn't know if we were going to make it. Yeah. Yeah. That we went to an emergency session with our therapist, I think the next day. The very next day, we had like a two-hour session with him. We had a couples group like a day after that. It was yeah. bad for weeks. Yeah. I mean, you went away to teach a retreat. I had two retreats back-to-back -back in Mexico that I had so to you were lead. gone for two weeks. I had to hold space for all these other people while I'm suffering. And it probably was the best thing for me because it allowed me to heal and see it from a distance. Um, but it was it was a really hard time. Yeah. No, it was it was tough. And that's... Again, kind of getting back to if this person ever does this again or does this to me, then I will leave thing. You asked me that day, like, are you going to leave me? And I was like, I'm not going to fucking leave you. Like, we've gone through all this shit. We've married, like, we're married with two <laughs> children. Like, I'm not leaving you because you're a fucking idiot. But, but I, but I was so full of fear that, you know, to me, I was like, he might leave me right now. I might lose everything. I made one mistake and I might. I might lose everything. And it was yeah. so scary. And when he said that, it's crazy because we were so cracked out and hadn't slept all night. And like, we're so, we were in such a bad place. And when I asked you that in the hotel room, our friends had already left and it was just us and you, the amount of hate that was coming out of you and like anger and disgust it would just freaked me out. And when yeah. I asked you, like, are you going to go? Or, like, are you going to leave me? 
and you were so adamantly like, I would no, we're not, not leaving you. I was just so, I was in shock mm. because I, the dysfunction and the relationship I was in in the past was so up and down that we would just say we were leaving each other all the time. Like that's just yeah. what we did. Well, and I think that to me that that speaks partially to the willingness to do the work in a relationship. And like we talked in the tip in one of the other um, episodes, episodes, you know, it's a decision, right? Like being in a relationship and a loving relationship is a decision. Obviously there are good parts that you want, you love and you can't wait to have more of, and there's shitty parts that you have to make it through if you want more of those loving parts. Otherwise, you're just in new relationships all the time. Exactly. And we had gone through so much and you had put up with so much shit that I've done that the notion that I was going to dismiss all the work you did to forgive me totally. because you fucked up, I just literally but I think couldn't... I, be- I just think I also didn't... like Couldn't imagine that someone could love me that much. Mm. You know? Because I had never gone to that dark of a place before. Like in any capacity. Like I was a really good kid and I was a really good, you know, daughter and I was a really good sister. And like, I was a really good girlfriend to my first boyfriend. And through all of it, I was such a good girl. And so for, for me to like, in my mind, fuck up so royally and you still love me. I didn't even understand like what that meant. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Again, you had done the same exact thing for me. Right. right. But I, I am the person who does that. I'm the one that's there for other people. Yeah. I'm not the one who falls. Mm. So it was really beautiful for our relationship. Like it was one of the like turning points yet again for us where I really got to see you and see parts of myself that I pr- I never experienced before falling so hard And then still being like my hand still being held and you being like, I'm not going anywhere. We just have a lot of fucking work to do now all over again. And you know, when you even said like, we've been through this before, like we know what we're doing here. We're just going to have to get back to the drawing board. Well, and one of the questions that people asked us was what if, so this is one of the questions that we get a lot, which is the once a cheater, always a cheater, whatever, like what if something happens again? What if somebody emotionally cheats on you or physically cheats on you? And this kind of flipped the equation for us because I didn't. Right. And I hadn't at that point in like six years or whatever. Yeah, more than that, actually. Um, and here it was you who did it. Yeah. And we were at a whole new, this was a whole new situation. Yeah. And yet we still had the, the, the tools that we absorbed and learned. We were hoping we're still going to be useful for exactly, this. Exactly. Now, I got to say, from my standpoint, like, for all your ability to see that this was going to be useful, whatever, it took a few days before you were at the place that you're now talking about in terms of taking responsibility for it. Like we, yeah. we got into fights. Like you, you were mad at me oh, for yeah. like three days. I was like, so bitter. I was so, again, I was resent. I was in a place of resentment where I was like, this is your fucking fault. And you did all of this other stuff. And now it's my turn. And yeah. I need you to hold space for me and not punish me. No one needs to punish me because I deserve to, do this. I am allowed to also fall and I am allowed to do things that all of you other people have done. One night stands and lying and all this stuff. I was so like in a place of power and in my like femininity. And it felt like it, I felt recalibrated. Like I owned my sexuality. I owned my femininity and it was an extreme and it was dysfunctional and it wasn't good. It wasn't like a great thing, but it was something I needed for my healing. And well, we have talked about that for years yeah. because through your relationship or whatever it was that happened to you in the past, you had kind of written that stuff off exactly. and then we went through our traumas. And so there was, and still is like sexual problems for us to work through because of the, our histories. Yeah. But I mean, I remember there was one fight when we were in the car on the way back from that couple's meeting where I did think it was done. Mm-hmm. Like, I actually thought it was done. Like I was ready to leave you. You had cheated on me, and you were threatening to take the kids away and leave me. Yeah. And I'm like, wait, I'm sorry, what? Yeah. Um, and so I, the reason I'm saying this is, for those of you who are still listening an hour into this interview, um, tough shit. Like, this is scary. not easy. It got scary. If we're keeping count at this point, at least four times during our relationship, it got actually scary, like we are done. And at this point, we have two children. We've been married for, you know, several years. We've been, we've known each other for a decade. I mean, talk about so much to lose. 
it was horrible. It was such a sad, horrifying experience because it felt like every layer we had more to lose. Every, every time that one of these things fell or happened, we had so much to lose. We just had, we had our family now, we had marriage, we had all this time and energy and people that trusted us and, and us doing all this work. And when you put so much work into something and so much time and so much energy, you don't want to have to give up on it and you don't want to have to start over. It's not like we had had a loveless marriage for 10 years and all of a sudden I cheated and like, oh, now I have to start over. That's a bummer. We really worked hard at it and we didn't want to be defeated. We didn't want to have to start fresh. We both knew that we wanted what we wanted and this was our time to, this was my time to show up and own what I had done and also not feel ashamed about it. Like there was that part to me at first that was like feeling very ashamed and dirty and gross. And I can't believe that I'm now that person who has sex with someone they don't love. And now I'm a cheater, all those things. And it's, it helped me learn so much about you, about my partner. And like instantly in that moment that the medicine that I received from this experience instantly, and then weeks and months to come from no longer judging people if they have sex out, you know, if they have sex with someone they don't love or you know, just all of these different layers of like, I couldn't even imagine having sex with someone I didn't love before this experience. And then I was like, Oh, I get it. It was just like a physical, like I want nothing to do with this human as a human, but it was a physical experience that felt good in the moment. Sure. And I got to understand the trauma of having somebody cheat on you. Like I never did before. Exactly. Cause that trust being broken and like yeah. annihilated, like piece of glass on the floor shattered into shards. And you're like, wait, I'm supposed to put this fucking piece of glass back together? Exactly. So it allowed me to see that in a way that I never could before. Like Full I circle back to perspective, right? Yeah, I still to this day sometimes wake up again. Like when you were telling the story, I wake up sometimes like fantasizing about finding this guy and punching him out, you know? And it's not, not a him. rational thought. And I have it's, the same thing about Ashley, the very first girl. Yeah. So, you know, when people ask like, what is too much? Honestly, that's up to you. But the question I ask on a pretty ongoing basis is like, is is the person that you're with maliciously hurting you because they want to diminish you and make you suffer? Or are they fucking up because they're human and they screw up? Or they, And because they have flaws and they have some deep things that they need to handle. And they're Get, doing the work and they're doing the to work. heal. Or they're willing to do the work. If, sure. If at any point along the way one of us said, I'm not, there's nothing wrong with me accept who I am or yeah, I get this is there's something wrong with me. I'm not fucking doing shit about it. I'm not Deal doing anything it. about it. Like this is, this is who I am. I've I, heard that before from men and women both. Like yeah. this is just who I am. That's probably not acceptable. And you probably should move on at that point because, or at you, least for us, that wouldn't work for us. It definitely wouldn't work. Right. We wouldn't be able to be here. Um, and maybe you're okay with it. Maybe you're okay. Kind of holding that space for somebody else, either until they're ready to, or doing the work, Instead of them, you can't do the work for somebody else, though. So that's the thing, right? And and so for us, even coming out of this, I think it actually taught you a lot. This is the session when we did that emergency session with our therapist where you actually said, well, if he cheats again, then I'm gone. And our therapist was like, really? Yeah, the therapist looked at me and was like, so let me walk you through. Let me walk you through a scenario. Adid cheats on you. Hold my hand through this. Adid cheats on you again, and you leave him? And what does the cheating look like? At what level do you decide that you're going to leave right, and, the levels and, thing, yeah. and break up your family? Like and if he texts, like, like if he texts a woman inappropriately, yeah. is that, are you leaving him? Well, no, not for that. And then he kind of walked you through this. And I realized that as a defense mechanism to protect myself over time, I had created this, this shield. Well, if he does the X again, I walk. And that kept me a little bit at arm's length. And from our relationship and help helped me to feel safe in my mind. But really it was hurting our relationship because I had one foot out the door. Yeah. So in that moment, after I had cheated, after we had been through almost 10 years of stuff, I finally came to the realization that I want to be in this relationship for better or worse, no matter what happens. And that Adi is my person and the person I choose to be with to father my children, to connect on a daily basis, to be my best friend, to be my cheerleader, to be my support system and vice versa. He's the one that I choose. 
And every day I have a choice, but it's not about if he does X, then I'm out the door. It's I'm in this for the long haul, no matter what. And he's there for me, no matter what, unless we decide one of us isn't in love with the other and doesn't want to do the work anymore. And if at that point you say, and you're clear that you don't want to do the work anymore, then you, you owe it to your partner to tell them that you don't want to do the work anymore and you're no longer in it. And that's where the openness and the real trust and the transparency come in, right? Like you cheated, but you told me right after, um, it's, it's so such a cliche, but it's so, so true. Like it just, you just get better at these things over time, right? Yeah. It's practice. Like now we have 10 years of practice of building intimacy in a real relationship yeah. and we are doing a million times better at it than we did originally, but there's still gaps and sure. we still periodically contact our therapist and like, Hey, we need to work through some shit. Can we come and see you? Um, and sometimes there's resentment to that. Sometimes one of us feels like we should go talk to a therapist and the other one doesn't. And it kind of brings yeah. up stuff. I think just for anyone listening, we got a lot of questions after I posted it today. A lot of people wanting to know like when enough is enough. How do you deal with once a cheater, always a cheater. So I think we covered those topics. Um, another thing that people brought up a lot was like, what do you do when people, when their support system, you know, if they're, if your friends and family just kind of don't, don't agree with your decision, that's a hard one too. You know, like yeah. plenty of people in my life didn't support at any of the levels of like the first cheating, the second, the third, they didn't, you know, my own best friend when I cheated on a D left me for several months and said that I was, you know, not a good person anymore. It was like to her. six months or something. It was like four. Yeah. yeah. And we finally came back together and like now she's endlessly sorry and so loving about it all. And, you know, and it made us closer because of it. Um, but you know, she held me up on a pedestal for so long and then all of a sudden I did this thing and I only had one place to go and that was to fall and, you know, showing my vulnerabilities and, and to people I love should be something that even if I am flawed, they shouldn't leave me for that. And I should feel, and you were the first person that I, I tested this with Mm. like really giving my all and being vulnerable. So again, coming back to vulnerability, radical transparency, whatever, oversharing, however you want to put it, those things helped us heal. And also, also time. So there's one aspect that you can't rush. And I remember sitting in therapy with a D and our therapist I was actually sitting on the floor on a pillow and I was like, I'm good. I trust him now. I trust him. And the therapist looked at me and was like, I I don't believe you. I think you're willing this. Like you really want to will this into you're rushing it. Yeah. And I was you know, we were several months, maybe six months, a year into it. And I was like, no, we're good now. I'm fine. We can change the boundaries. He's no longer in the doghouse, but for a long time he was punished and he was in this place of like, you know, I had to do that to feel secure and safe because if he wasn't in the doghouse and he didn't have these strong boundaries then I no longer felt safe. But at a certain point, you need to respect the relationship, the work that you're both putting into it, change the boundaries, let, let go of the reins a little bit. And I see this with our couples in our couples meetings. I see this with our couple friends that come to us. If you're holding on so tight all the time, if you're holding on for dear life, that person has no flexibility and space to explore their own tendencies and feel like if they're never allowed to travel on a work trip or they're never allowed to like go to a cafe on their own or they're not allowed to go to a yoga class because they might look at a girl. Is that really healing? And yeah. to me, I feel like I want my partner to be exposed to different situations and test them and test himself and start to build like a tolerance about it all so that yeah. you're not constantly like scared of a billboard. And it took us a super long time to get to that place. And I know a lot of people listening are not quite there, um, but you get there through the transparency and the honesty and the resiliency that your partner builds by saying, oh, wait, he can look at that billboard and not have to lie to me. He can tell me about it. And, and it doesn't mean that I'm not beautiful. Yeah. That's another thing is it's your own self-respect. So you have to do the work on yourself so that you know it's not a personal thing. Don't take it personally. It's not, it's their own stuff. It's their own experience. And for me, it was really hard to understand that like him 
my man partner could be attracted to other human beings. Like, why is that such a shock to me? That was mm. my own work. Yeah. And I had to open up and realize, oh, I'm actually attracted to other human beings too, both men and women. And, oh, there's no shame in that. And she can be aesthetically pleasing for me to look at, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to cheat on my husband with her. Right. Or him. And, and one thing, so we'll talk about a lot of the growth stuff in future ones. We just wanted to get the story out so everybody sure. knew everything. Um, one thing that I want to say that gets hard here, and it's really, really hard to do, but I see it with clients that I work with now, is celebrating the successes. This is a really difficult thing to celebrate, right? Like, I don't celebrate, hey, I haven't cheated on you in nine years, babe. You know, give me, I don't I don't get like a, a victory lap for that or anything like well, that. Well, although, you know, if you were in 12 step, you'd get a coin or whatever. You'd get a birthday cake, right? Right, and, and within those rooms, you get it. I don't go to those meetings anymore. Yeah. We don't do any of that. But I'm saying in real life, you can celebrate. I haven't done drugs. I haven't shot up heroin in 15 years and people will applaud you. I haven't cheated on my wife in 15 years. Nobody's applauding you in, in everyday life. I applaud it. Thank you. <laughs> um, I mean, I internally applaud it. But what I was saying is, I think it's important to take stock and recognize your victories as they show up. Those little growths of, oh, we're not afraid of this thing anymore. Or, oh, you can take a trip on your own. The reason it's important to push those boundaries is if you keep yourself locked in, it never feels like you progress. Exactly. You only know that you're progressing because something that used to not be okay is now okay or something that used to cause you pain and anxiety no longer does. But if you don't do it you until it doesn't cause it. you anxiety, it'll never get there. No, you have to test it. And it's scary, but you've got your partner. And if you're in this together, if you're really in this together, you have to test those limits. You can't always stay safe because I know plenty of couples who are in a similar situation that we were and the partner that did the acting out doesn't cheat anymore. So therefore, they're like, oh, I'm safe. We're good. We're going to stay right here. And they have not moved. They're stagnant. Yeah. It's not just not about cheating. It's not about just not doing the bad thing. It's not about not just grabbing the beer bottle. It's about the tendencies. It's about the feelings. It's about the thoughts. It's about the relearning, the communicating, the intimacy, the vulnerability. It's about so much more than the act of cheating itself. Yeah, exactly. I mean, right, the, the whole problem, like we said, is I had learned to seek sexual intimate connections, which lead into other intimate sort of connections, in outside things. It started with porn, then it led to other like... By the end, you weren't even physically touching a single human being. It was just online and you were still getting high off that. So what are we... And so we had to uncover all of that. And and you had to become the person that I came to for those intimate moments. Exactly. Instead of running away and getting a little serotonin and dopamine hit from porn or masturbation or whatever, I had to learn to come to you to talk about the things it's a little bit more work, but it lasts longer and it's much more satisfying over time. Oh, yeah. And you don't get that shame kick at the end of the whole thing, which you're like, fuck, I messed up again. Um, and so, you know, I think we've, it's been like an hour we've taken people through this and guarantee some people are like, what the fuck am I listening to? Yeah. Right now? This is shocking as shit. You're free to leave shit. now, guys. <laughs> um, but I want to, uh, the message for us is this. And again, we will get into, we might even do an entire like, hope-based version of this one day when we go through all the different things we've done for growth and expansion because there's a lot of that. But the point I want to make is just like with all the other success-based stuff that we talked about, just like with everything else we've talked about before, which is you fail when you give up, we're not telling you to stay in pain. We're not telling you to stay with a partner that is causing you actual pain and is trying to hurt you. But if you're in a relationship where you're working with your partner on making things better, Think of the fact that the alternative is to have to start all over with somebody else who likely has their own version of damage, likely has their own version of inappropriate intimacy, etc. Doing this work, for Sophie and I at least, has created a relationship that we never would have imagined beforehand. We, we didn't even know we could have something like this. And most of our friends now use us as an example of the kind of couple they want to become. And it's not stress-free and it's not completely pain-free. But it's a real, intimate, deep relationship where I know my wife knows me better than any other human being, and I, I know that the opposite is true as well. And there aren't any hidden parts to me that Sophie doesn't know exist. Sophie knows things that nobody else in the world knows about me because I know that I trust that she will hold that and still love me even though she knows those things exist about me. And that is the real gift 
of having a partner. The real gift is knowing that you wake up next to somebody who actually knows you and is with you because they know you, not because there are parts to you that you've hidden so well that they don't understand them and therefore they're still sticking around with you. Mm -hmm. And the reality is you got to go through the work. You got to gradually like chip away at that shame and open up to them. And in the end, yes, your partner is the person where you can stand naked in the room and not be ashamed with them at all, figuratively and, um, and you know, uh, literally, yeah. um, because they know you, they know all of you, and nothing is going to shock them. Even as you make a new revelation, you come to them with it, and you go, oh my God, I just realized this thing, and you go, oh, cool, or I knew, I knew that before you knew it, whatever that is. And I also want to just add that I really feel like all of this was a blessing. I really do want to share that because if you are struggling now and you've read my articles that we put in the show notes and you've got made it this far in our podcast, I have to add that because somewhere along the way, a couple years back, I realized that all of this is for me. It's not against me. Life isn't punishing me. It's not like, oh, why do I attract these men and then ugh, I'm the victim. I truly, in my gut, in my heart, in my soul, know that I attracted these experiences for my ultimate learning, for my ultimate growth, and to be the best human being I can be. Because now I have gone through all of these experiences through my sexuality. I am now I now know myself in ways I never could have gotten on my own thanks to these experiences. Yeah. Were they hard? Hell yeah. Do I wish that they weren't so painful? Sure. But that's the way you grow. Yeah, absolutely. And in the end, guys, we wish for all of you, for you to find somebody that you are happy to do the work with. Yeah. Somebody that respects you enough to do the work f with you as well so that you get to keep growing together. And you know, next thing you know, it's 50, 60, 70 years later and you could not fathom Life, life without with anyone them. else, yeah. Um, Absolutely. Because we, I believe personally that that's out there for all of us if we do the work. Yeah. All right, so thank you for those of you who actually stuck up to this moment. Thank you for sticking with us and listening to us. Um, as Sophie said, no, no shit talking on this actual page. But I get it. I get this is painful stuff, and we're, um, I'm happy we got it out there. And We're going to go have a good cry now. I hope that it helped you all. Mwah. Love you all. L much love. Bye. Bye. From the moment I wake up till the instant I go to sleep, as most of you know, my day is crazy full. I often share my schedules on good old Instagram, but for those of you who don't know, I am running three inspiring businesses. I have three gorgeous children running around the house constantly, and in between helping them with school, creating alone time with the D, and also carving out some solo soul time for myself, there is basically no room left in the day for anything else. I really do know how it feels when I load up on unhealthy foods and it's not a great look. I don't have time to stress about these added fillers or sugars or whether my food will actually make me and my family feel good and be nutritious. And that's what I love about Philosophy Superfoods and why I started this company. I know that they are trustworthy, that they are packed with high vibe antioxidants, minerals, adaptogens that all help me deal with what the world throws at me each day. I love my life. I love my children and my jobs. And I want to be able to really thrive in all of these things and put on a bunch of different hats and roll with the punches. And Philosophy Superfoods really allows me and supports me in wearing all those hats. If you would like to stock up on our Philosophy Superfoods, which are always organic, raw, incredibly sourced nutrients, use the code IGNITED, that's I-G-N-T-D, to stock up for you and your loved ones. You and your body will feel so grateful for it. All right, we are back, and I think you'll agree that was a lot. Uh, and we hear that from you guys all the time. Those of you who are going through this in the moment when you first get exposed or somebody shared this episode with you, it's a lot. It's a lot to take in. Most couples don't share this deep a level of intimacy. And so we're going to move into this 
processing lessons, questions you guys have asked. But first, Sophie's going to kind of bring us back to earth after having this really deep, intimate experience. I'm so grateful for all of you for making it to this point and for you know, listening to this, sharing this episode with so many of your loved ones. It means the world to us, and we hope that we're helping someone have a glimmer of hope. If you can just find your feet on the earth, if you're sitting in a chair, just find your feet. Make sure they're flat and put your hands in your lap. Just close your eyes and take a deep breath in through your nose, filling up your chest, your lungs, your heart, your belly. And a long exhale out. Two more times, just like that. Deep inhale through the nose. And let it out through the mouth. Fully releasing. And your final deep breath in. Deepest breath you've taken all day. Breathe in, in, in. And stick out your tongue. Lion's breath. Good, and blink your eyes open. Welcome back. We want to process with you. This is a big story. If it's your first time listening, we know it's a lot. If it's your fifth time listening, thanks for coming back. We know there's so many nuggets in here, and we really want to break it down with you, reflect, and really look at the lessons. So one of the first things that we really want to make clear, and we've definitely talked about this before, is the fact that the cheating wasn't about the cheating. And and a lot of times, in like so much of our work, We end up focusing on the symptom and thinking that that is what it's all about. But after now years, literally over a decade of talking about this and working through it for Sophie and I, it's so clear that at the beginning of our relationship, sexuality was not a match between us. Sophie and I didn't know how to talk about it. She had this five years worth of trauma. You know, she would literally cry uh, whenever we would have sex. I didn't know how to handle it. We're going to talk in a second. I had no idea how to intimately connect on an emotional level. And so I tried to find a way to run away from that and fill it in with somebody else. And that somebody else was the person that I cheated with. Um, The cheating seemed like the most important piece of the puzzle, but it wasn't. And in the same way, so for you, you know, that night was not really you looking specifically for another guy. It was like needing attention and then somebody else giving you that attention that you were craving for me. Absolutely. And I think it was also a way of relating. I was like, huh, I've never tried this before. Like it was literally like this thing that I always said I would never do. The opportunity was there. I wasn't in the right state of mind. My inhibitions were not there. (laughs) And you know, it's like, it's multiple layered things, but it wasn't about that. I wanted to sleep with this man. Yeah. And, and the reason we wanted to start out with that is so many people will get to this later too. have the whole once a cheater, always a cheater thing. What, what that ignores, though, is why the cheating? Yeah, because that's so important. And, and so much of that also has to do with how we actually came on the other side. So first of all, let's be clear. We don't believe once a cheater, always a cheater is, is a real rule. It's a real thing. What we do believe is if somebody cheated and you don't really do anything, you just kind of sweep it under the rug and you imagine it'll go away because he got caught and he feels bad about it, then there's going to be a problem. If Sophie and I didn't step in, and do the heavy lifting, the really deep work, some of it you've heard throughout the last um, few years now in the, in the podcast, but I just want to summarize it, right? Like we've seen multiple therapists for years. We're actually about to start embarking on a new therapy um, journey because we know that doing work on your relationship doesn't mean there's something wrong with it. It means you care enough about it. We also really had to dive deep into this trauma that Sophie had around sexuality and, and cure it or fix it somehow, right? And you know, for us, that was this, these MDMA journeys. Plant it was medicine. Plant medicine. It was, it was intimacy and opening up our relationship and really experimenting and learning new things about our sexuality and Sophie's openness that would have been unthinkable early on in our relationship, but because of all the work we've done, have created massive, massive changes. And And I just want to talk about this real quickly because I get this question from a lot of people. What was it like being in the doghouse? Especially guys, if you're listening to this right now, a lot of guys ask like, well, were you in the doghouse? How long were you in the doghouse? And that's actually the way our first therapist described it as well. And yeah, 100% after the first cheating episode, I was in the doghouse. Um, Also, by the way, partially for as long as I was because we didn't understand exactly what was happening. And Mm -hmm. so it was this like, hey, why don't you go 
suffer for a little bit and, and pay your dues. But I got to tell you, now having the perspective, what everybody's calling being in the doghouse was really a, a time period, and like a year and a half. It wasn't very, very short. But a time period for me to actually reflect on how my actions impacted Sophie. And, and reset. In, and instead of trying to defend myself, right? You guys have heard us talk about this thing of going in for the punch. I had to learn over that year and a half when Sophie got triggered and was traumatized and, and came to me really punching me in the face, literally, sometimes and figuratively, you know, more like just being aggressive because she had just gotten triggered. My job was to take care of her. My job was to make sure that she understood that she was no longer at risk. My job was to put my arms around her even as the shame crept up and all the embarrassment and all the guilt about the ways that I screwed up. And that's a big one for guys to listen to. So many guys think they're just going to hang in the doghouse for a little while. Sleep on the couch, sleep in the other and room. And then it'll just get better. It'll just get better. And if you do that, your relationship will not improve. Right. And I want to add, that is all very true. I want to add what my responsibility was in this. Yeah, he was in the doghouse. He was doing work. Guess what? If I would have just kept him there and been like, you fucked up. No, I had a responsibility in that. Part of what made the whole thing happen was my intimacy, my traumas. Was he my partner? Should he have dealt with that with me? Yeah, but we didn't have the proper tools. So what were we supposed to do? He did what he could do. And at that point when he was in the, quote, doghouse, it was my job to look at myself and see what is it within me that made this thing happen. It's not just a one-sided thing. And the minute that I got involved, the minute that I took responsibility and I said, oh, this is actually about me also. It's not all my fault. I'm not some damaged person that like deserves to be cheated on and hurt, but there's something about me that thinks she's not worthy, which we'll hit on in a minute. Doesn't have the confidence, has been through a lot of trauma, hurt, pain. I came to the relationship with all of that and I wasn't hiding from it. I was crying during sex. I was, you know, fully insecure. Like there was a lot of stuff going on for me. I I wasn't very mature. I was barely 20 and So I came in with all of that and that affected our dynamic. And the minute I stepped into that and said, okay, what is the work I need to do on myself personally? Then I saw my own therapist. I started digging in to do my own work. I started reading books on codependency and all sorts of other kind of books that helped me to do my own reflecting on what was important in my side of the street? What could I do to keep my side of the street clean? Because I didn't know at any given moment, I didn't know that we were necessarily going to survive all of this work. I just knew we were digging in and we wanted to give it a try. But what would happen at the end of two years if we emerge and we realize we're not actually a great fit? And that, that I would need to do my own work because I want to evolve after two years of doing work. I'm not going to sit there with my arms crossed And after two years, he does all this work and all of a sudden we realize, oh, we've actually grown apart because you're evolving and I'm not. So I had to take responsibility for myself. And same thing when I cheated, Adi didn't just ignore me. He was like, we've got some work to do, sister. And we did. Yeah. And this really brings up a lot of you ask the question, well, when do you know if it is enough? If there have been multiple cheating episodes, if it's not, we're doing some work and it's not fixing. And one of the things we always say is you both have to be committed to the work. And you hear Sophie talking about it. It's so easy. Like, I I see how easy it is right now as I'm saying it. Your partner cheated on you. You go, you fucking asshole. How dare you break. You fucked up. How dare you break the the trust that I put in you. Yeah. And. And it's true, by the way, if, right? It's, that's a good starting point because it's fine. I get it. You, we, there was a huge breach of trust. The idea that then there's only one person that has to do the work is different. So when you ask me or you ask us, how do you know when enough is enough? Words are not enough, guys. They're not. So yeah. somebody telling you that they want to change is a great start. The next is showing up to do the work. But I want to I clear this up. It's not quick. And even if somebody's doing the work, it doesn't mean that tomorrow everything is better. It doesn't even mean that next month everything is better. What I always look for in the couples that I work with and the couple that Sophie and I work with is gradual progress. So normally the way that turns out is stuff you couldn't imagine talking about at the beginning is now up for discussion. Maybe you're still fighting about it like crazy, but you're talking about stuff you wouldn't have talked about before. Then eventually you learn how to ease the tension and how to talk about that stuff in a way that is less triggering and less aggravating and less anxiety provoking. But the work 
is not just about words. It has to be action. And so oftentimes what we found is you have to look for pro- professional help. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously we have our relationship. We're in trouble. But like go see a therapist. Do whatever it is that works for you too on a consistent basis. I mean, we're talking 11 years into this process for us. And we are always looking for new things. And we offer a lot here. That's why we have this podcast. We are sharing what works for us. We're sharing what we're interested in. The healers, plant medicine, thinking outside the box, psychologists, psychiatrists, different movies, documentaries, producers. We're bringing sex experts you know, people that are helping you embrace your inner goddess. All of last December, we had this be- all of this whole intimacy for the for the female body and learning about the female body. Like, we are sharing here all the resources. So come back to this podcast as a free resource, and then go from there and find out what works for you. Some of these episodes won't resonate; it'll feel way far out there, or something you would never try, but you're interested in it. If there's something that sparks your interest, that's the point of Ignited. We yeah. want to spark something that feels like a good fit for you. Sure. So like MDMA might sound out the window for you. Um, opening up your relationship and being monogamous or trying to even talk about other people, watching porn, any one of those things might sound insane. Remember, we don't talk about it, I think, in this episode, but Sophie bawled her eyes out the first time we walked into a sex shop. Pushing up against your discomfort is not necessarily a bad thing. What has to happen is you have to listen to yourself and be be connected in the partnership. So you're not doing things only to push boundaries, but you're doing things in a way that feels like you're building your comfort level and your connection. Yeah. It's about being, going through something together. Like, would I push those things on my own? Not necessarily, but my partner and I want to push the boundaries so we can grow and we can try new things and we can keep things interesting because we've been together 16 years. Shit gets boring. And also, so uh, maybe we can talk about this for a second. Like here, I'll, I'll use an example. Like, the whole idea of opening up your relationship. It sounds incredibly dangerous. And I remember when you first, when we first even mentioned it, and it was actually around the MDMA experiences and, and breaking through some of that early trauma, you said something that was big. And I think we've talked a little bit about how that shifted for you. The idea that once you try something, you cannot back up and you can't undo. You can't undo what you've seen. And I think that way of thinking leads a lot of people to just be very risk averse and not try anything, and right? Just like super fearful, super of any new experience. Well, and if I try that thing, I can never go backwards. I can never take it back, and I will never unsee you doing that thing or me doing that thing. And if or something, talking about that thing, whatever it might be, and that's just not true. <laughs> think about women that have given birth. Do you actually remember the pain? Because I don't. I've had three babies, and I don't remember the actual pain. All I remember is that love and and release I felt afterwards when they handed me my baby. Why? Because our body isn't meant to remember the actual trauma and if something goes wrong. And you know what? Leaning into something that's scary helps you become stronger. Especially if you do it in an intimate safe connection, safe, um, you know, after talking to and processing with your partner, not just jump into it. So for instance, we have had experiences that we needed to really backtrack from. And what we find is normally that's when one of us is going along just because they feel like they have to rather because they're really, really yeah, into it. Yeah, that's a really good point. Making sure that as a couple, whatever your coupleship looks like, whether you're married, whether you're not, whether you're gay, no matter whatever it is, everyone has a different relationship. That's what's beautiful is we all get to write this beautiful relationship book together and it's different than someone else's. No two relationships are the same. So knowing that, first of all, is that you get to make up the rules in your relationship, but you have to make up those rules with your partner. The two of you have to be on board. You both need to sit down and write those chapters and what comes next and be prepared and feel safe. The, especially the person, it doesn't have to be a woman, but whoever was cheated on, if this pertains to you or has been through trauma, needs to go slowly and it needs to be soft and it needs to be something that feels like it's for the relationship to be better and to try something new to strengthen the relationship versus going into something way too fast and then feeling violated. Yeah. And one of the things you've heard us talk about a lot that allows us to have that communication is the concept of radical transparency. So I'll mention it very, very quickly. And then I want to explain how we were able to put that into play in a way that's worked for us long term. Radical transparency is going beyond honesty. It's talking to your partner about the things they don't even know to ask you questions about because you know that if they knew that you were having those thoughts, they want in on that conversation. Super uncomfortable at first because you've never had these deep conversations and you're scared. 
you're scared, especially if there's been trauma in the relationship, but if you've had it even before in other relationship, you're scared that you will say something that will make your partner turn around and leave. And I totally get the fear, especially if there's been cheating in your relationship, but I'm telling you, radical transparency for a lot of the couples we worked with allows you to not have to have that fear again. And I'm going to have Sophie talk about how that fear has been impacted in her version of our relationship here in a second. But I want to tell you how I, as a guy, was able to do this. And part of that was by really getting connected to my feelings. Now, I got to be honest with you, 11 years into this, it's a work in progress. But 11 years ago, I wasn't able to express feelings. I didn't know what they were. Uh, I didn't know. I knew the words for them, but I didn't know how they actually felt. I never would have brought them up in an actual conversation with my partner because I felt like that would make me not a man, and and you know all these other things that you can talk about um, is the stereotypes that come along with men expressing feelings. But part of what ended up happening for us in our radical transparency transformation is when I feel good and when I feel bad, when I feel humiliated, when I feel anxious, when I feel overwhelmed. Having the the nuanced conversation with Sophie, even in the face of screwing up, even in the face of slipping up, even in the face of maybe go, going a little close to a boundary that we had set, it's really the intimate connection and the feeling and the conversation about it that my wife wants. She wants to know me. And when my wife gets to feel like she really knows me and I'm not hiding things and she can look into my phone whenever she wants to, check my location, go in my email and... Odds are, pretty much 100% of it is stuff she already knows. I That's either, transparency. I either know or it doesn't matter and it doesn't it doesn't seem like a surprise. And that's the thing is I don't want any more surprises ever again. And for someone who might be listening who's been through deep trauma, you know, this is for your partner to listen to. So if, let's say, the female in the relationship went through some cheating and the male cheated on her, like husbands, boyfriends, just know... Your job is to figure out what your wife, what your human, what your lover, your friend needs. What does she need to feel safe? What does she need to or feel... Or he. What does he need? Or he. Yeah, I was just giving that exact example of if it was the husband that cheated or boyfriend. But whoever was cheated on, it's, you know, they're in a really broken place. You have to take it slow. A DNI took all of these things, like everything that we're telling you, all these lessons are over the last 11 years since the first time... He cheated on me at UCLA and we, we've been doing all the work, but it's the job of the person who cheated to lean in and figure out what makes that other person feel safe and loved so that you can begin to build back that trust together because that's the goal here. Yeah. And I want to talk, I want to make a promise to the men listening to this right now because I didn't know this when it started. I was just kind of going, we had a kid. We were married. I did not want to lose. I knew I got a really special woman. I didn't want to lose her. And I was just kind of going in blind, to be perfectly honest. What I realized, a lot of us are afraid that by having these relationships, we give up freedom. And I got to tell you, using the techniques that we talk about, over time, I've had more amazing experiences, more mind-blowing experiences, more intimate, closer, more joy-filled experiences in this marriage than I had in any of my single days, first of all, but certainly way, way more than I imagined being able to have married. But it all comes back to the safety and transparency piece because with my wife knowing that I'm not doing anything behind her back, the level of openness and transparency and trust that came in from her is incredible. And with that, when you really have your best friend and somebody that you're attracted to right there next to you, you can have a pretty amazing life. Yeah, you get to do life together in the most beautiful, big way. You get to take risks and chances. And I want to say, I want to remind all of you, because you didn't get to hear the very beginning that we cut out. When we first met, I was in such a broken place. And I did not believe that I was worthy. Like I had been manifesting getting out of my unhealthy relationship for like fantasizing for a year and a half, manifesting, getting out the perfect timing. I, I saw it all. I saw my new partner. I really believed that I was deserving of someone else. But then when a D came into my life, you know, it's scary when the thing you manifest is right in front of you. And I want to remind you that in all things in life, when you manifest something really big, it can be hard to absorb it. It can be hard to take it in. Your body then stretches and you're like, whoa, I don't know if I can hold space for all of this. So there was this man that came into my life who was confident, 
worldly, spoke different languages, was from a, a foreign country to me, was, you know, getting his PhD, had been to jail, had all this life experience, and here I am, this broken little 20-year-old who loved herself but came out of a really traumatic experience where I had to keep dimming my light. I had to keep squashing down my confidence. I couldn't be too big. I couldn't be too beautiful, too sexy. And then I met this man who was like, be all those things and more. I see more for you. And I'm like, I can't even fill up the space that you're asking for. That's now. So just know that part of my issue in the beginning and why it kind of caused so much turmoil and why it was so hard was that I wasn't ready to step into my power. I wasn't ready. I didn't know how. I love hearing that because I can't imagine you not being in that place now, but it's definitely the place that you were in when we started. You were still pretty. You still had friends. You were still popular, but you definitely had this like, you know, like a shriveled up flower. When it came to men, when it came to men, I was shriveled up and scared. And I mean, there were times just as a quick little, I just had a flash. There were times when my boyfriend and I would be broken up usually because he cheated on me or like did something awful, like ripped something up or like destroyed something, wrecked my car. And I would be with someone else because I was trying to heal and move on. And he would come into the room. (laughs) He'd find me hours away somehow and would storm into the room, beat the crap out of the man and like take me and like put me into punishment. Like that was what I was coming from. I was so afraid of expanding and exploring. And so I, I just didn't. I just closed that part of my heart and of my body. So I was so damaged, even though I still loved myself and had confidence in other ways. When it came to men, I did not know how to expand and be the fullest version of my own beautiful, sexual, sensual, expansive self. So D expected that of me. And, and just like any manifestation that feels big, it's hard to know what to do with it. So I'm just here to remind you, like, If you're someone who has someone wonderful sitting in front of you and you don't think you're deserving of that person, that is your work to do right now. Mm. That doesn't mean push them away. I very much pushed the D away. I was scared. My lesson here for you is if you're listening, tell that person how you're feeling. They're your person. Be radically transparent Mm. and say, I'm scared right now. It feels like a lot. I've been dreaming of something like this. I hear that you're saying this is the most beautiful possible love and that you have that perspective. I don't know how to handle that. I don't know how to hold space for that because I don't think I'm worthy of that type of love. And I want it. I want it with my whole being, but I don't think I'm worthy of it. And what can I do? I need help. And That's it. Just talk it out. And if it's not to your lover, then maybe it's to your best friend, but you need to speak to someone. I repressed all of those feelings because there was nowhere safe to go because I was so ashamed of the past relationship I was in. So just starting to use your voice and say, there's something wrong here. I don't feel confident. I don't feel well. I don't feel safe. Whatever it might be, just starting to speak is the very first step. And from, you know, the, the partner perspective, I think what's beautiful about listening to that is Obviously, especially, I think, if you're a semi-confident partner who really wants the best for your lover, you want them to be the best version of themselves. And for some of us, there's this like, you know, I'll call it slight jealousy or whatever that that can develop sometimes that if they get big enough or too big or they're too beautiful or they're too out there, we're somehow threatened because somebody else might pick up that rock and might might give her attention. And I want to say something that came from a friend of mine, um, Boris, years and years and years ago when we were out at dinner. And I see this now with Sophie all the time. I was dating somebody else at the time. But she had gone to the restroom and come back. And um, it would take a while. And I went to look inside the restaurant. And she had stopped on the way back from the restroom talking to this dinner table, like, full of guys. It's all these guys in suits, probably like a work dinner or something like that. And for a moment, I had this tinge. I'm not normally a very jealous guy, but I had this tinge. And I went back, and because he was a really good friend of mine, I told him what was going on. And the first words out of his mouth, and Boris, if you're listening, you probably remember this right now, but he said, don't you want to be dating somebody that a table full of business guys wants to stop by and just talk to for 15 minutes? I mean, isn't that kind of the person you want to? Don't you trust your partner enough To know she's just having a conversation. She's just getting a little charge maybe from the attention or whatever. And she's going to come back. She's going back to you. And it really resonated for me. Again, I wasn't really a jealous person even before that. But it was even more. 
I want a person who's so open, so sure of themselves, they don't have to hide. And if attention comes, I'm not threatened that it's going somewhere else. But that's right back to that radical transparency. It's right back to that idea that you have to be so whole and be so communicative with your partner that even afterwards, you can talk about it. You don't have to hide from it. You don't have to pretend like you didn't see it. You get to have the experience. And I'll tell you, for the women, men, partners, lovers, whoever is listening right now, again, I'll go back to this point. When you have this happen, there are experiences in life that open themselves up to you and your partner and and the relationship you never would have considered before because they would have felt threatening to who you are in your relationship. And that can run the gamut for each one of you. Those differences might be completely other than our our experience or, or than what you could have imagined. But the magic is what we all really want is love and belonging and trust from our partner. And without what we're talking about right now, you're kind of walking on eggshells all the time, trying to not rock the boat enough so that nobody falls out. I think also all of these things are just truly just little lessons, little gifts. The universe is putting something in front of you. How can you look at it differently? If you're, you're at a bar and a you know, and your boyfriend walks up to some hot girls and they start flirting with him instead of getting mad and jealous, because that's such like a, yes, that's a primal response, but go deeper and ask yourself, what is that feeling that's coming up? Like really, like we said at the beginning of this episode, when you listen to it, don't make it about the cheating. Don't make, don't make it about the symptoms, make it about the actual source, yeah. where is the pain? Where is the actual pain? What are you really worried about if he flirts with hot girls? Are you worried that you're not enough? Are you worried he's going to leave you, cheat on you? Are you worried that somehow it makes you look bad? What is it that you're really fearful of? Because that's what we want to focus on. That's what this podcast is about, is really stepping into the fullness of who you are. Who cares if you're with other people or partners if it's about you two having fun? Who cares if you're both on board and, you know, you try something crazy new, like some new sex toy or someone brings it in and it's not about being jealous. It's not about there's something being wrong with you. And so getting to the root of it can bring up a lot of fun and a lot of fear and a lot of a lot of feelings, but that's the point. The point here is the intimacy. So both of you going through something new together, not necessarily doing any of the things we've ever mentioned, but looking deeper at where is my responsibility in this? What do I need to heal so that we can have more fun and more play and more newness in this relationship? Yep. And you can look through so many of the guests that we've had on the show for ideas. And there are millions of ideas. The point is, This is your relationship. Celebrate it. Find ways to make it new and exciting for you and your partner. Forget everybody else and how they feel about what you should be like. If you can connect intimately, love each other, explore in ways that are safe to both of you, but also feel like they're exciting, right? One of the things we had to do was replace my need for like dopamine hits from other people with the experiences Sophie and I are having. And they are together and they are watching stuff and they are playing with things. They are all the things that make us excited to be together. And they, by the way, they're not all sexual. I know yeah, we're focusing it, on some of the sexual stuff, that. but they're not all sexual. Yeah. We, we find ways like I know a D needs those little hits of excitement. I do too, but in different ways, a D needs that there's parts of him. That's very adventurous. He wants that. So I'll say, go out on your motorcycle for the morning. Like go have an adventure because that hit is really what he's craving. It's not, it's not about the thing that was the bad behavior. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Um, Look, we could talk about this for hours. We've been talking about it for two and a half years, technically. But (laughs) we want to kind of summarize this for you in in today's episode. So you can go back and refer to it and, and learn and take the lessons. And so we've heard from so many of you. I mean, literally hundreds and hundreds of you, couples, women, men, writing us, talking about how you've been through something like this and you've had some of the questions here. So we really, really hope that we've been able to answer some of the added inquiries and little curiosities that you've had because that's literally why Ignited exists. And knowing that every single thing you go through in life, whether it's in a relationship or not, the hard things are gifts. They're gifts from the universe to learn more about yourself. If you can step back, bird's eye view, and look at the experience instead of saying, why is this happening to me? Why is this happening for me? 
What is this that I need to look at? Why am I struggling right now? And really looking under the hood and figuring it out, whether it's in a relationship on, on your, or on your own. Absolutely. Absolutely. And thank you so much for being on this journey with us. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for loving us. We love you right back. Yeah. And thanks for giving us a forum to bring all these amazing experts over the last two and a half years that we get to learn for on a regular basis. We are here for you. Let us know what more you want, what in this resonated, what follow-up questions you have. This is why we're here. Thank you so much for joining us. We will see you next week.